Hi, welcome to the NASCAR and NBC podcast. I'm your host, Nate Ryan, and we're talking here on the Monday morning after the race at Richmond Raceway, and I'm joined right down the street by Kim Kuhn. Uh, Kim, last time I think we did this in person, you just came two miles up the street uh, to join us here at the studio, but uh, I appreciate you doing this, even though you're so close, uh, via video because we missed the podcast last week, so it's good to Good to be back on the uh, Motorsports on NBC YouTube channel. So thanks for being here. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm right down the street, but either way, it's great to talk to you. Yeah. Oh, well, and it was good to see you this weekend. And apparently I missed you uh, at one point in Richmond. Um, I used to live in Richmond, so I do a lot of running there. And um, you have discovered one of my favorite parts of the city that I like to run through as well, Carytown. And uh, apparently I almost saw you Saturday morning. Yeah, I saw you. You didn't see me. I didn't. I, I somehow missed that you used to live in Richmond. I have a handful of friends that apparently used to live in Richmond that I was unaware until I started posting about things from Richmond this weekend. But in terms of city offerings, it's one of my favorite stops on the circuit. There's so many good gems there. But yeah, I gotten up early uh, to grab a coffee and a, a breakfast bite from a place called Sugar and Twine, which is kind of right in that Carytown area, and was in my car and I saw you running. I was 99% sure it was you. But I saw that you had uh, pods in your ears, and I was like, I don't want to honk because there was like a line of twelve people deep. I was like, I'm gonna end up, you know, scaring all these people. I'll just <laughs> I'll find them at track and say hello. Well, I was glad you you found me and did say hello. And uh, even though there was a line on Saturday morning, I'll give you a tip. I ran by on Sunday morning, and at like seven twenty, there was one person in line. So oh. apparently. Saturday morning, it's it's much busier than Sunday morning. So for your right. future trips to Richmond, which I completely agree, gem of a city, um, great place for NASCAR to visit. The racetrack has changed a lot. We're going to get to that in a little bit, but let's start with um, Richmond Raceway. Uh, the winner of the race is Chris Busher, who wins for the second time um, in less than a year now. Uh, he won at Bristol Motor Speedway last September during the playoffs. Uh, and I want to start here, I guess, Kim, because... I don't feel like I know a lot about Chris Pusher and I feel like that's somewhat on me. And I, I don't know if we in the media have done a good job of sort of exploring the Chris Pusher story. I know that some of it is he wins the 2015 Xfinity championship. He won as a rookie in cup, but then he sort of mostly toiled in obscurity in NASCAR's premier series for six seasons before he had this semi breakout year last year with Roush Fenway Kislowski racing wins for the second time at Bristol. And like I said, wins again this year and is now in the playoffs. So he's made nearly 300 cup starts, but I feel like I barely know him. And again, this is my fault. So I'm coming to you. Like, what do you know about Chris Buescher? I, I would say I kind of fall in the same circle of you. I, I know some of his story, um, obviously from Texas, uh, salt of the earth person, um, but I think I think kind of this persona we get, this kind of, I don't want to call it mysterious persona, we just don't know him as well as maybe other drivers, it is kind of to his liking and to his credit. Not that he's elusive necessarily when it comes to media and doing things. He is always extremely uh, compliant with interviews. He always is happy to talk. He's actually one of the drivers that I enjoy interviewing and, and talking to only because he, he is always very willing to. But he kind of is is a little bit not shy, but he's just not one that's gonna be flamboyant about you know what he thinks of this and and, and eager to to talk about that. You, you can get it from him, but you definitely have to put him in the position to talk, kind of dig for it. Um, and then once you get talking to him, you know he's a wealth of of information and, and he's happy to chat. But um, you get you get a, a very strong sense of humility and the best type of humility, I think, from Chris Buescher, um, maybe out of, out of anybody in the garage. Yeah. And I think you're right. He's extremely accommodating um, when you ask him for any reason. Like Saturday during the driver bullpen at Richmond uh, after qualifying, I, I got him by myself and he gave me like five minutes. And when you when you ask him questions, I think he gives you, as you said, sometimes eloquent, long answers. I mean, he tries to give you what you're looking for, but he doesn't seem like he ever seeks out attention. And he's certainly not, I think, like his uh, teammate slash car owner, Brad Kozlowski, where, you know, Brad's got some big picture views and he likes to share them. It, I don't know. Maybe there's a yin and a yang there that, that that works, or maybe it's just that 
he's a great driver, uh, w- which is obvious g- given he's got two wins in the last year now in the Cup Series for Chris Buescher. But it just it seems like he's just sort of underrated, but yet appreciated by his peers. I know I, I just I have a hard time kind of putting my finger on the what the Chris Buescher story is. Yeah, I like that underrated but appreciated. You get a, a real sense of like a blue collar guy. He's he's willing to do the work. Um, you know nose to the grindstone type of personality. Um, I, I get the sense that he he's very physical away from the track in terms of, of getting dirty and working on the land and that sort of thing. And so I think, again, he's a salt of the earth um, kind of personality, doesn't seek out the attention, but happy to give you the time if you ask. Yeah. Um, and you had him... Uh, Cause you were, you were not working for NBC sports this past weekend, but you were working for MRN radio and we were just talking, you, you had him as part of your, your uh, pit sections. Um, what's he like to listen to during the course of a radio? And what was it like to hear him during the course of this win? I mean, did you, could you tell, cause he started, I think 26th. Um, somewhere, he, somewhere deep in the field. It was a, yeah. it was a Herculean um, task by him, but he did have a great card too, uh, to get to the front of the field, knowing how hard, it is to pass at Richmond. Obviously, strategy came into play, but he's pretty even keel on the radio. You know, over the course of my time covering the sport, you don't ever get, you know, the, the hot temper, hot headedness from him. Um, that's not to say he doesn't have passion. He doesn't have, you know, drive. He doesn't get riled up, but he seems to maintain, um, compared to other drivers, a good sense of calm on the radio. Um, same with his crew chief. I mean, Scott Graves is, is a very calm um, kind of personality when it comes to the radio. Although once, once they took the checkered flag, it was very much like they were excited. You could tell on the radio. Um, and I think the nature of the way that race ended, um, helped showcase Chris's ability more so than it, than if it had gone green to the end, um, which I think was awesome. Like when the, when the, uh, caution flag waved at the very end, I was kind of like, like as much as you love to see a restart late in the race, I was really pulling for Chris. Uh, he was going to be a new winner on the season. Um, you know, we watched the tra- trajectory of RFK. And so, you know, you try to be neutral, but I was kind of pulling for Chris. And so to see that caution come out, knowing how good Denny is, you know, depending on how the, the pit stop was going to sort out on restarts, knowing how aggressive Denny has been recently and some of the other guys that were around, you know, that hadn't had wins yet this season. So it, it was going to be a, uh, big effort on that restart. So I think it almost makes the win even, you know, more poignant. The fact that, you know, he had a dominant car and then he had to survive a late race restart. Um, but yeah, kudos to them. Yeah. That was uh that late, late race uh, restart for Daniel Suarez. spin was the only so-called natural caution, three caution flags, uh, two for stage breaks and want to get to that with Richmond being such a strategy race, but you brought up RFK as an organization, Brad Keselowski led the most laps, uh, had a pit stop that went awry uh, where he he locked the brakes coming in. So he ended up finishing outside the top five, but still a strong effort. And he was asked afterward, you know, what this means to the organization and and kind of struggled, I think, a little bit to to frame it. Um, and he he can be that way because I think he, he's he realizes he's, he's the team leader as the as the co-owner. But uh, I think it essentially means, I mean, they're almost guaranteed two playoff spots now because Chris Buescher is now locked in and Keselowski is so far up with four races to go. I don't think there's going to be enough new winners to like bump him out, even if he doesn't win in terms of points. So what, where do you think right now, Kim, that RFK ranks as an organization? I had some, I heard some um, over exuberant, I would characterize it as colleagues in the media center who were asking like, is RFK the best Ford team um, in in Cup? I, I I'm not all in on that. Like I feel like that's a little bit overboard. Like I still think you, you got Penske, you got Stuart Haas. RFK is like in the mix and they've run well, but I, I don't know if I'm ready to like put them in like the final eight of the playoffs yet. No, not yet. I'd like to see more consistency over the course of more than just uh, a year and a half from kind of the changes that were made when Brad came in and and where they're going with the team. Now, if we're having this conversation next season and, and they have a couple more wins under their belt, and obviously there's there's comers and goers, so that's still going to be relative to what the other Ford's teams are doing, then maybe we have the conversation of they're at the top of the podium, 
the totem pole for uh, the four teams. I do, I do think though they are at a place where they're toe to toe, if not maybe have a toe over the line relative to SHR and and SHR still winless on the season, and they've got four drivers compared to two. Now SHR also had a really strong showing this weekend um, at Richmond. We've seen them also have short track speed, which we've seen from all the Fords. That seems to be kind of where they are strong this season compared to other tracks. But, you know, I, I'm not going to put RFK at the top of the Ford list. I, I think still, you know, it's hard to argue against Penske. And and even they aren't where they could be or where we expect them to be. But I would put RFK right along, you know, even with SHR at this point, in my right. opinion. Right, right. Uh, yeah, and just to put a cap on that, that like Kozlowski has now three top tens in his last four races, but surprisingly for Busher, he had only had one top ten in the previous mm-hmm. five races. So I think you're right; that consistency is is still something they're looking for. So, uh, but they they played the strategy right, obviously, and that is what Richmond has become. And we talked about this on our uh, NASCAR NBC production meetings last week, heading in this race that. We were expecting long green flag runs because that's what this race has been the last few years. I know in your role as a pit reporter, you talk to a lot of crew chiefs in your prep for each race. Um, What was their take? I mean, was everybody just kind of expecting that this was going to be a race where it was just going to be all about plotting out strategy if, if you're a team? Yeah, it was all the talk I had with crew chiefs was about tires. Um, And because it went, you know, green for so much of the race, they didn't have the opportunity to to kind of play even more tire strategy than we could could have seen if there had been more cautions. Every crew chief I talked to that morning said they wanted it. They wish they had at least two more sets of tires, which is funny because um, I think the teams that that made the most stops either were right on the line of using all their tires, maybe even had one more set. Some of them. So um, just the nature of how the race played out with so much green flag racing. Yes, we did see strategy, but not as much as we would have seen if we had had a myriad of cautions and crew chiefs were having to decide, all right, do we put our qualifying scuffs on at this point? Do we save a set and stay out? Um, So that was a lot of the talk in the morning is what that could look like. You know, if we had had a caution in the first stage, that first semi-lap stage, a lot of teams had talked about putting on their qualifying scuffs to save a set. Um, All of that really not playing out because of how, how many green flag runs we had. Yeah. Did do crew chiefs like this race, do you sense? Because they do have maybe more influence on it than I mean, it almost it feels like they're almost running it like a road course where, um, you know, you can clearly make a, a lot of uh, impact in terms of your strategy. Do, do you sense that they like this race because it it is sort of like that? Uh, I, I probably would say it's a mixed bag. And, you know, some crew chiefs, I think, flourish and love a, a challenge like this. Um, especially if, if there would have been even more strategy options, others are just kind of like, kind of like, Oh, like we, we know we, we kind of like know we're, we are in a position where we have to take four tires every time we don't have as many sets as we want. Um, and maybe it's not their favorite. So I would say it was, it's probably split. Okay. Uh, well, unfortunately I feel like that reaction, the, ugh, um, probably true for some longtime fans of Richmond, uh, Again, I used to live there. I used to work at the newspaper there. So I've probably covered more races there than any other track on the NASCAR circuit. And uh, my first race there, I remember, was the fall of 1998. Actually, it was like late summer. September of 1998, Jeff Gordon and Jeff Burton battled side by side for the last 15 laps for the lead. I mean, literally side by side for the lead, like one of the greatest finishes I've ever seen. And I just thought, ah, all races at Richmond are supposed to be that way. So flash forward almost 25 years later here we are and we're talking about richmond running like a road course even though it's it's a short track um do you have any sense because i i can't wrap my head around like how it's changed i know there was a repave they don't seal the track the way they used to do um 20 plus years ago when the sawyers on the track before it was sold to isc and then nascar um is it tire degradation do you have any sense for like why it doesn't seem to race like a short track as much anymore yeah, I can't put my finger on it either. All the factors you listed. And then on top of that, the the way the cars have changed. I don't know that the last actually, you know, two iter- this this iteration and the previous one 
have set themselves up at, at Richmond for great racing. But I do think, you know, despite that, despite the fact that we are, we aren't necessarily seeing, you know, that side by side for 10 laps straight kind of racing that we would love to see at Richmond because, you know, of the surface, the fact that there is tire wear, tire fall off, it is still a very interesting race. Um, and it makes it interesting if you are a little bit of a gearhead, especially to watch this race and watch it play out and, and see the different strategies. You know, we did see a couple of different strategies in terms of uh, how many stops teams took for tires. And so, you know, even though we don't have that side by side racing, at least we, we still fall back on this. Well, you know, there, there is strategy you can play here, but I don't know what the solution is to, to getting it to be side by side. And at this point with the next gen car, you know, we've had complaints about, you know, needing better racing at with the short track package in general. So is it something that we look at the car, you know, I know there's, there's, they're testing right now. They're staying an extra two days to test. Obviously we won't see those changes until 2024 for the short track. So is it a car thing? Is it a track thing? Is it a tire thing? Is it, you know, a weather thing? Is it a, you know, we've, we've had, we went back and forth at Richmond doing day races and night races, and you have different opinions on that too. Should we be racing in the day there? Should we be racing at night? Um, I, I would, I love day racing, but it was a hot one. So <laughs> yeah. I, I wouldn't have minded a night, a night race, uh, this past weekend only because the temperatures were so hot, but that's just me working it. I think, you know, from a hot, slick, hard to race track perspective, it was probably good. Yeah, I go back and forth too. I mean, like when I think about the halcyon days of like Richmond selling out a hundred thousand plus seats, l- legitimately having a crowd of a hundred thousand plus people twice a year, all, obviously that was Saturday night. So I, I feel like their brand is very much associated with Saturday night at that track. But at the same time, I, I think the daytime races have produced at times better races the last few years. And you know, obviously that that plays in the the track being slicker and and that the comers and goers and the tire where uh, where that you were talking about but um you know we, we talked about the impact of the strategy on crew chiefs obviously it has an impact on drivers uh as well and i know you had martin truex jr uh as one of your drivers and he he had this weird strategy thing going on where they they leapfrogged by running longer than anybody else i think in in a couple of stages and and mixing up how they're going to do their stops but it seemed like it was very confusing to poor Martin and he was asking for any sort of explanation. What was your take on everything you heard there? Yeah. I just don't, I don't know if they weren't giving him enough information, but if you had the opportunity to to tune into Martin's radio, especially during that last stage and after they did their final green flag stop and after the, the field did their green flag stop. And at one point before, you know, that tire situation played out, he was 20 something if and got on the radio asking like, where am I? I don't know where I'm running. Like what position are we in? What are we doing? And there were a couple of times after that too, after things, um, you know, were cycling through that he didn't really trust what the strategy was. And he got a little chirpy on the radio and, and, and even said like, I don't think this is going to work. Um, wanted more explanation. Um, and, and, and maybe the team could have done a better job of, of setting him up for what their idea was. Um, he didn't think the tire strategy was going to work in their favor. Ultimately it did. Um, At one point, James Small did come on the radio and said, you know, we don't have to stop again. The other teams have to stop. This was after they did that final green flag stop in theirs and the other teams were waiting to do their second stop. And so, and we've seen this before from Martin and James um, where, where they they get a little quippy with each other, but I, I think that that's, that gives them an edge as a team. I don't know. I think it works in their favor, but you know, they had that strategy. I think Michael McDowell did too, where for stage two and then the final stage, instead of making it two stops within the stage, they split it down the middle and made one thinking, you know, A, they would have a little bit of an entire advantage to a point. Yes, they would have to be able to maintain um, on old tires. But then, even though we didn't see a ton of cautions, it would also leave them with more sets of tires than the other teams had. Now, that didn't exactly play out, but it did ultimately work in their favor, especially because... The 19 car was not great. You know, Martin was complaining all day long. It was absolutely sideways. Uh, didn't like the handling of it. So, you know, I, I think he maybe had uh, pace, but he definitely didn't have the car he wanted in terms of drivability. And so that strategy worked in their favor to get them uh, a top 10 finish. And you're right. Not the first time that we've heard him and James Small get a little bit chippy with each other and, and Truex chirping 
uh, when he's unhappy with things. But knowing that we're still waiting to hear on if he's going to drive beyond 2023. And it sounds like, you know, from what I heard this past weekend, that like this really is something he's wrestling with. Like it's not a given, even though he's had this resurgent season this year with three wins, not a given yet that he's necessarily going to come back. Do you, do you think that plays into it at all? That like when he has a day like this and he's, you know, mulling if he wants to keep doing this and devoting so much of his life to it, like, is he thinking, ah, maybe I just want to walk away from this? <laughs> I think so. I mean, yeah. every driver will tell you when, when you're having good days and you're winning, it's fun. And when you're not, it is hard. And I, I don't know that we, that people give enough credit sometimes to the drivers, you know, they show up, they practice for 20 minutes, they do a race, but the actual work that goes in seven days a week into prepping for a race. And I do think Martin's probably spoke a little bit about that, that it's not just a show up and race kind of thing. It's like you're doing the homework, you're in competition meetings early in the week, you're watching, you know, video and notes and S&T data, looking at what other teams did, looking at what you guys did in the past. And so it's not just a weekend job. It is a seven days a week, you know, if you're not putting in that effort you're not going to see the results kind of situation. And so um, I think that plays into his decision. And again, to your point, I do think like when you have bad days, it's kind of like, why would I keep doing this sort of thing? Yeah. I mean, I guess a seven figure salary probably uh, helps a little bit in terms of alleviating those feelings. But at the same time, I mean, he's been driving in cups since 2006 and he seems like a guy who sucked a lot away I, I suspect that he's probably good if he wanted to walk away tomorrow <laughs> yeah but, you, one, um, one would think but uh yeah. you also look at you know the the desire to be a multi-time champion and they're the current points leader and you know I think that compounds frustration you come in the points leader you want to leave you want to leave the points leader granted William Byron didn't have uh anything for anyone um yesterday but I think there is the desire to get that that other championship and you know if that were to happen would he drop the mic i don't know that it would be kind of a cool move i think and so you know i think you're looking at a couple of different things that funnel into you know his frustration is you know they weren't having a bad day they want to maintain the points lead and, you know they are going they are a legitimate championship contender yeah uh you mentioned there um hendrick Certainly, their uh, struggles were very much a surprise. Larson, Byron, I mean, Chase had um, like a top 15 finish, but kind of a, a middling day. Bowman wasn't really a contender. Um, other competition elements that you take away from Richmond, I know Stuart Haas was fast, but they had mm -hmm. the pit mistakes by Amarola and Priest. I know there were some other pit mistakes. I mentioned Kozlowski. What mm -hmm. other uh, top line competition elements that, that you take away from Richmond? Yeah, lots of pit mistakes, and it wasn't just a singular team. It was across the board. We saw it from Bubba. They had a trouble on their right front. We saw, you know, Priest have trouble. Granted, that was kind of – he got punted by William Byron, Brad Koslowski coming in hot, although he kind of salvaged his situation. Um, you know, after locking up the brakes, was able to get in his pit. He had one tire out, but it was the right rear, and that's the one tire you can have out of the box and it not be a penalty. Um you had Eric Almarola with a commitment line violation. There was another, I think Tyler Reddick also had a commitment line violation. And so to me, they are looking at all that. It makes me think, all right, well, who's our champion then? Because yeah. this isn't, this isn't, yes, there are a lot of green flag stops at Richmond. So there's more opportunities to make those mistakes, but this has been a trend. I would say all season, if not definitely the last like six to 10 races is we're seeing all these mistakes. We're seeing them from very strong teams. Um, even at the, the top of the leaderboard, you know, Truex and um, William Byron, you know, the guys that are within a, a shot of getting that regular season championship, they are even making mistakes. And so to me, it's like, all right, when is somebody going to step out and have, you know, maybe not a perfect race, but a very solid mistake free race. And not only that, a string of those type of races. And I don't think we've seen that from anybody. And I think that's what you need to be a champion. And so when does that start to happen? Because I haven't seen it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And um, yeah, Truex might've had the strongest day, I guess, of like the, who I would consider contenders. I mean, certainly I would put Byron in that camp. Um, I mean, Kyle, I mean, Bush, Kyle, Kyle Bush had a great finish. They were, if we're talking, you know, notes from Richmond and maybe surprises, RCR has admittedly, they will, you know, you talk to Randall Burnett, uh, crew chief for Kyle Bush, and he will be very honest with you uh, about their short track program 
falling short and they've known that and they've tried to throw stuff at it. They tried to throw stuff at it in New Hampshire that did not go their way. And I think we saw strong runs both from Austin and Kyle. Now, both of those drivers uh, typically do well at Richmond um, historically just as drivers, but uh, there was a lot of questions about what kind of package uh, or what would they would face this year. Yeah, that had to be a huge morale booster after New Hampshire was fairly a disaster of a weekend for for the number eight team. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Kim, you're coming back to NBC Sports at Michigan, which we love, uh, but you were doing MRN at Richmond. You've got one more uh, at Daytona where you'll be uh, focused on on that side. And and what's it like for you switching between the two? I, do you, is it a different type of role when you're doing pit reporting TV versus radio? Do you have to, start, have to like recalibrate your brain in order to like call them differently? Or is it pretty much like the same sort of process? Uh, there's overlap, but then there's definitely things that are very different from radio to TV. And you do have to kind of like recalibrate and think about it. Um, there, you know, you, on, on the radio side, you do need to know the storylines. <clears throat> you do have to be, you know, up to speed on your notes and, and do prep work, but the prep work isn't as in depth as it is on the TV side, um, for a couple of reasons. The first and foremost being like on the radio side, there's no visual for the fan. So you're literally describing and, and illustrating the picture for them and what's happening on the racetrack. And so that takes up a lot of your reports it is describing what's happening. And it's it's not that TV's not in the moment, but TV leans on the picture to to tell what's happening. And then, you know, the reporters are are more storytelling. Um Versus radio, which is is almost regardless of what position you are, whether it's a pit reporter, a turn person, or a booth person, you're giving play by play is what you are. So so the prep work is definitely different. Um, uh, and then you know the roles are the same, but also different. I, and I don't know if that makes sense if, for somebody who okay. hasn't done it, who doesn't do it. Um, but yeah, they're they're as much as they are similar, they're also extremely different. And, yeah. and for TV, you have to, you know, because the fan can rely on the picture, you have to make your reports so much quicker. Whereas as radio, you have the time to kind of illustrate what's happening, take your time. Um, I mean, you still want to convey the sense of this is a race and it's you're on the edge and it's fast paced, but uh, delivery is also very different. Yeah, kind of having that longer runway to be able to talk about things on the radio side, does that make it easier for a race like this where you have these long green flag stretches, not as much action so much in terms of yellow flags, cautions? Like, is it easier, I guess, when you when you kind of have time to sort of draw it out a little bit more? Yeah, it, it definitely is easier. Honestly, that's kind of where radio and TV are the most similar, in my opinion, is that when you is the nature of the race and how the race um, kind of unfolds. So like anytime you have, you know, longer green flag runs gives you the opportunity to bring in other voices. And that's the same for radio as it is in TV. And you'll, you'll, you know, you'll hear that if you're listening to radio and you'll, you'll see it and hear it when you're tuned into the TV broadcast is when it does get kind of strung out and there's green flag runs, that's where you do bring in, you know, all the voices of the broadcast, whether it's the Peacock pit box or the booth or the pit reporters and really do a deep dive into, you know, more storytelling. What, what can we tell and update about these teams that we have the time to do versus like a super speedway where people are jogging the entire time and the racing is so close. Both of those are, are, are TV and radio are very similar in that, you know, you're lucky finding a time to get a word in because the, the action is, is so compelling and you don't want to break into, you know, the call of the race to give an update when, you know, that is, that is the story is what's happening on track. Yeah. And um, I encourage people to check out Kim's last visit after Atlanta. She did a great job sort of explaining what that's like as a pit reporter, trying to like process all that information from all the spotters and like how you have to sort of separate wheat from the chafe and figure out like what are, you're actually telling people. Uh, Cause it's so frenetic, so frantic. Uh, another thing that you do, obviously, in your job as a pit reporter, both radio and TV, is is interviews. And I feel like the big story coming into Richmond certainly was Denny Hamlin versus Kyle Larson coming off the heels of Pocono. And 
you were a part of that um, <laughs> because you did maybe the most memorable Kyle Larson interview in history, which is impressive given Kyle Larson's credentials, 2021 Cup Series champion, um, among other uh, very uh, impressive racing accomplishments. So I want to ask you a little bit about process, Kim, here again, because I, I think I think there's a lot of interest in this. I think people would be interested in it because you got three questions with them um, and you did a great job like hitting all the right follows and getting to give you a little bit more each time. So I'll start with when did you know you were going to be talking to him and, and did you have all those questions in mind? Cause I know that like, I haven't done as much pit reporting as you, but I've done enough to sort of know that like sometimes everybody knows who's talking to the winner, but like in terms of the rest of the top five, you don't always know like who you're going to get. I know that we have, you know, pit reporters designated to certain teams or sections of pit road. So was he in your section? Did you know you were going to be talking to him? And when did you kind of like go through the process of, all right, here's what I got to ask him about after that incident with Hamlet. Yeah, so post-race is always frantic as much as you can try and plan it. Um, and we knew Marty was doing the winter interview, and then it's kind of just a, a give and take of who has what. We typically, if you have that person on pit road and you're doing post-race interviews, like to to give you know the pit report of the people they have because they followed the stories all day. And honestly, because so much happened, um, I'm trying to remember if Larson was even in my section. I want to say yes. Um, but don't quite remember, but regardless, we know like when there's big moments, big dramatic moments throughout the race, we kind of make note of that and know we want to talk to those people after, um, and even if they don't finish in the top five. So NASCAR does a good job of, of communicating with, you know, our producers, you know, who do we need to hold for you guys? Who do you want to talk to outside of? the typical top five, top 10. And so we knew Larson was a target. Um, I had gone to Truex first because he was runner up, got to work with him and then heard of my producer, we need to get Larson. So walked all the way down um, pit lane because he finished 20th or, or 21st. Um, and I think one of the important things that happened with the Larson interview is it was done live. Um, and we don't always have, you know, the freedom to, to interview every driver live, you know, they have places to go. They want to get home too. Um, and, and you're very lucky if, you know, you have a, a driver that you can get live versus taping it and then playing it um, minutes later. And so I, I, that's not to say we wouldn't have gotten the same interview from Larson, but um, I asked my producer if we could do it live. Uh, we did have to wait through a commercial break. I told Larson we are waiting to do this live. And I think that that in itself helped the interview versus, you know, huh. if he knows it's taped because we have these jerk cams where they can see what's being broadcast. And I do think regardless of who you're interviewing, that makes a huge difference. Um, maybe not a huge always, but can, can make, I should say a significant difference in the type of answer you get from a driver. So I think that was one thing that worked in our favor in terms of getting a great interview from Kyle. Um, I obviously knew I had to hit on the Denny stuff. Uh, so, you know, as I'm walking over there, I, I kind of think about what my first question is going to be and, and you can have an idea of everything you want to ask, but you really have to be in the moment and, and be listening to what the driver says to then ask the follow-up questions. And, uh, I do think I, I pushed it a little bit. It's rare you get three questions, but yeah. Larson seemed like he wanted to talk. Um, I appreciate that the, uh, kind words that you and others have given me. And I do think you have to ask the right questions and you have to read the driver. But I, I think we should give some credit to Larson because even if you are at your best as a reporter and you ask the perfect questions and you deliver them in a way that um, is great, you still can have drivers that don't want to talk and, and can, can shut you down regardless of if you're at your best. And so I, I do want to give a little bit of credit to Larson for, being the most forthcoming I think that we've ever seen him. Yeah, no, I agree with you completely. Like I go back and forth. I just serve a chicken, the egg thing. Is it harder to be the interviewer or the interviewee? Mm -hmm. And you're right. Like sometimes you can ask the best question and not get the best answer and, and vice versa. Um, I, I'll go back really quickly though, to what you were saying, live interviews versus taped. It, you think, is it that drivers just know when it's live, people are seeing it where as when they tape it, uh, maybe they won't use it. Maybe they won't use all of it. Is that sort of the difference where? Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. Uh, I'd actually be curious to, to get a driver's uh, specific, 
specific perspective on it, but I do get a sense that when they know it's live, it tends to be a better interview. Now, there's always exceptions to the rule where, you know, you hear a great soundbite that, you know, was captured and, and played later. That's not to say that all taped interviews are bad and all live interviews are good, but in terms of capturing kind of like the heat of the moment, uh, I do think that you are always typically better off or, or the odds are way more in your favor during live interviews. And the other thing, um, and this can work in your favor against it, uh, being the first person to talk to that driver. Um, so, so nobody had gotten to Larson in terms of other media. Um, and again, that, that in, in this instance, it worked in our favor at NBC, but in sometimes other instances, you know, after a driver's answered, you know, a couple of questions, maybe his, his thought processes change, or maybe it gets him more fired up. It can go both ways. But in this instance, I think it benefited um, us at NBC being the first ones to talk to him. And usually you get one question and a follow-up as a pit reporter. And sometimes a pr the producer might say, Hey, go a bit longer or ask about this. In this instance, like were you offered that third question or did you just feel like I got to follow one more time? Cause I feel like there's a little bit more to pull out of Larson. I'm just going to go for it. Um, I, I, it was an interesting situation because you're right. Typically we do have a producer saying, you know, dig for this, dig for that. But I, 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 I the, our producers did a great job, um, and directors uh, of kind of sitting back and realizing Larson was willing to talk and giving me the runway to do what I thought was appropriate. Um, so they actually weren't in my ear after, you know, I went green with Larson on the interview. Um, and I, I think that was actually helpful in this situation. So I asked the first question. Um, I knew I had to ask a follow-up. And, and that's where, you know, staying up with storylines, staying up with the industry benefits you because bringing in the fact that they are they have a relationship off the track. Maybe fans don't know that. Maybe they do. Um, asking that question, uh, I got the sense that this was a Larson we hadn't seen before in terms of the willingness to share. Um, kind of the mindset he was in, how angry he was. Uh, so I felt like I had the runway to ask more questions. And he didn't, he gave, he gave us good stuff in the first answer. Granted, there was, there was still more to learn and, and he wasn't, you know, he wasn't where he was by the end of the interview and, and offering up uh, what he did. The second question was, was his second answer was pretty good, but then you, he didn't, in his second question, granted, the question was about off-track stuff. He never really talked about if he's going to race any differently. You know, yeah. and we're here, we're here to cover the racing. So I felt like it was imperative um, that we understand what's going to go through his mind on track. And then, then I think, I think, you know, that final answer from Larson was the most telling of anything he gave us. Yeah, no question. I mean, very perceptive of you to realize like he was – he was ready to talk and he had yeah. things he wanted to say, but I think that final question kind of pulled the rest out of him and it continued at Richmond, by the way. I mean, he came in after qualifying Saturday and usually drivers do five minutes and bolt. He did 15 minutes and took every question and kind of elaborated a little bit more on racing Denny differently and on their history. And always had more history with him than anybody else. It was interesting. Uh, one more question on this. Have you had any feedback from, Larson or Hendrick Camp, or I know that obviously you've gotten a lot of positive feedback from media members like me and others, other yeah. reporters, but um, any feedback from uh, the rest of the industry or any that surprised um, you? Uh, I did get feedback from various industry folks, um, other teams and stuff, hadn't had the opportunity, wasn't really in position this weekend to, to talk to anybody um, from Hendrick. And I kind of wanted to give Larson space. I think like yeah. it's the week after you know, that's still the, the topic du jour. Everybody's talking about it. I feel like he's not that he's worn out with questions, but I don't think I gain anything in my relationship with Larson, um, you know, as a reporter diving in and, and finding him and asking him, I do think maybe next week I'll find him. And, and I do like to, I thanked, I thanked Larson after the interview in the moment, but I do like to find drivers after and, mm -hmm really drive home the point that I appreciate the time um, and, and tell him that his candidness, I think won over a lot of people uh, in terms of, of seeing a little personality from him. Um, I almost made it a point at Pocono or excuse me at 
Richmond not to interview Kyle. Like when we were having our meetings with MRN and talking about pre-race targets and obviously Denny and Kyle were targets. I specifically asked for Denny knowing, you know, I, I got a lot out of Larson and I don't know that I would want to get more and you never want to feel like you're wearing out a driver. And so I think, plus, yeah. you know, having a different person interview him gives a, a different perspective. Um, but ha- haven't heard anything negative or positive um, from, from Hendrick. Uh, but I, I probably will find Larson next week and just uh, offer up another thanks and um, hope and, and just say uh, everything is, <laughs> as, as crazy as it's been, hopefully uh, it's been good for him in terms of, of the feedback he's gotten on, you know, how he's dealt with it. I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine. I mean, you handled it like a pro. Uh, just curious, like, did Denny say anything? Uh, I interviewed Denny through a, a couple times throughout the weekend. He didn't say anything um, specific to me in my interview. I did see, I saw a clip of him um, in the media center at Pocono before he went to be interviewed, listening to his phone. Now, I don't know if he was listening and rewatching what we captured from Larson or what uh, the, the scrum captured, um, but the way it all played out, I, I, it worked out perfectly, you know, to get Larson's, to, well, actually to get Denny's original thoughts, then for us to get Larson and then Denny to be able to hear that before his, you know, post-win uh, press conference, because uh, I'll give kudos to, to all the editors throughout the industry that have kind of done this mashup um, that we saw from, from Pocono of, of Denny's availability after the win and then Larson's comments. Uh, I think, you know, the, the montage and intermix of, of their answers was brilliant and uh, really drove the storyline. So. Yeah. They gave us a ton to talk about. There was, was I, really yeah, I, think, I think Denny's kind of ty- tired of it though. Um, Cause in my interview with my pre-race interview at, MRN or with MRN this I had asked him about it and he 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 had some answer to the effect of you know he thinks that the media has made more out of it than it is which I disagree um but that was his take well as the host of actions detrimental I hope he realizes he's complicit uh in all of that when he talks about this stuff I, yeah, yeah, exactly. We what else a, are we going to talk about? Yeah, so we're get a thank you from Denny to because we probably in, increased his listenership for that week. <laughs> well, to spin this ahead a little bit and wrap up by looking at Michigan, uh, you know, we didn't see any of those moves, the Hamlin move at Pocono at Richmond, uh, although Chris Buescher was warned about it by Scott Graves when Hamlin restarted next to him on the yeah. inside for that final green flag. Um, Hamlin said it wasn't really uh, available to him in that instance, but I'm sure that it's something we'll be hearing about at Michigan, a, a, you know, two mile speedway, more similar to Pocono, certainly than Richmond was. Um, what do you think we might see, Kim? Do, do you think uh, I, you know, so many drivers were talking about it this past weekend? Um, and it seems like if you're not locked in the playoffs right now, this kind of move is fair game. Or even if you are locked in, it feels like it feels like there's just an accepted way of doing business now. If if you want to try to make a move on somebody in front of you, and if it, especially if it's the leader, and they leave the door open where you can get underneath them, go into the turn and and shove them out of the groove, have at it. Yeah, the comments from other drivers were interesting, and um, I, there was a lot of agreement that you know you it, it's situational, and you do have to kind of put other drivers in compromising situations and force their hand. But on the flip side, there were there were quite a few drivers, including, you know, Kyle Busch, Martin Truex Jr., who were vocal about, you know, uh, Denny's move almost being a little bit dirty and, uh, you know, not to say that they wouldn't ever do it. Uh, and again, it would be circumstantial, but um, you probably wouldn't see that move from them unless it was a specific circumstance. Now, with four races left until the playoffs, I think the door is wide open for anything to happen. I don't necessarily think you're going to see any of that kind of uh, racing throughout the race. Now, it's wide open with 20-ish laps to go, I think, uh, especially if you're if you're jockeying for, for the lead and you're a driver without a win. I think anything is possible, and I think the – Great thing is uh, the the upcoming tracks we have before the playoffs lend themselves uh, to a lot of on track action, a lot of potential for you know tempers to flare, for people to put other drivers in compromising situations. So I think it's a great time to be a NASCAR fan. 
It is. Uh, there's a lot happening uh, in terms of these moves being made, especially at these big speedways. And one driver I'll end here, um, Bubba Wallace, uh, is certainly right around that bubble. Doesn't have a win yet, um, but kind of maintained his composure. I, I know you said you had him on your radio at Richmond um, in a way that we haven't always seen. I know he, he kind of like took a little bit of a shot at Denny at one point, but for the most part, very cool, very measured and calm. Uh, and I'm sure he'll be looked at as a contender given how well Toyotas have run recently um, heading into Michigan. What, what do you what do you see from Bubba, both from Richmond and, and looking forward to Michigan? Yeah, I think it's a continuing evolution of Bubba's maturity as a driver. Now, you know, every driver gets upset about things, even if they're a, you know, longtime veteran and champion. So that's not to say we're never going to hear, you know, Bubba get fired up on the radio, but considering the circumstances, the fact that he had a dominant car, <clears throat> he led a lot of laps. Um, and then for the, the changer to have trouble on that right front, you know, I didn't, you know, I was expecting to hear a rant on the radio that I, I didn't get, I didn't hear, um, from Bubba. And so, um, Again, just more maturity, handling pressure a, a little bit better than we maybe have seen him in the past. And then I think looking forward to this weekend, he has a great opportunity here. He won his first Cup Series poll last year at Michigan, um, finished second to Harvick. Um, the Toyotas have been fast. So I think we should look for Bubba to be a contender uh, as we head to Michigan. And I think they're with – I, the, the point situation is still fluid and he could still drop out of the playoff picture. But I think, you know, at plus, I think he's plus 54. That gives him a little bit more comfortability to just go out there and race. And that's what he needs to do. That's that very much falls into what Bubba needs is to just be able to go out there and race and only focus on that. And so I think that works in his favor. They, they had a good points game this past weekend in Richmond. Yeah, we'll see four races to go if he can join Chris Busher as the latest new winner this season. And Kim Kuhn will be a part of NASCAR and NBC coverage this weekend from Michigan. So uh, thanks again for joining us on the podcast, Kim. I always appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I always like to be here. Hi, I'm Parker Kligerman. For more access like this from Pit Road, be sure to click and subscribe to the Motorsports and NBC YouTube channel.